Hello, hi. Uh, my name is Balaji Etirajulu, and uh, I'm a Senior Director of Product Management at Ericsson. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us uh, in this panel. We are really excited to talk about uh, edge-related projects and the network slicing exposure and, in general, different edge-related use cases. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. My name is Roman. Uh, I'm with a company called Zedera, um, working on the edge. Uh, super excited to be here, super excited to be able to hang out with all of my good friends from LF Edge. So hopefully you will like it as much as I do. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Tina Je oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Tina. Sure. Hi, this is Tina Joe. Uh, I'm an enterprise architect in ARM, and I drive ARM edge computer team at the company level. Also, I'm the uh, newly elected TSC uh, chair in Equino. I'm here to discuss with you the public cloud edge interface and is some popular end-to-end -end use cases and solution deployable for edge computing. Uh, hi, everyone. Super happy to be here on this panel this morning. Uh, I'm Malni Bandaro. I'm from VMware and their open source IoT Edge lead. I work on EdgeX Foundry, and in the past, I've been their security work group co-chair. Hey, Tina, since you mentioned uh, Acreino, uh, I actually had a question for you. So uh, obviously 5G is all the rage nowadays, and I think Acreino is doing a lot of things, you know, to kind of manage the use cases for 5G. So can you maybe talk a little bit about what's the latest and greatest from Acreino on that side? Yeah, 5G is definitely the keyword for Acreino. So there were... Um, Many blueprints, they work on 5G, and the most uh, uh, outstanding ones are the public cloud edge interface. Because, you know, today the public clouds like uh, uh, Microsoft Azure, where we have Microsoft guys in Equinix, they join this group to share how they think the public cloud is contributing to the 5G connectivity and the 5G telco edge total solution. And we also got the Tencent and Alibaba as a public cloud and also telcos like AT&T, China Mobile, China Unicom, they are making this really the collaboration interfacing uh, between the public clouds and also the uh, uh, traditional telcos. The edge is the place Either uh, the operators buy the products of telcos from public cloud or the public cloud walks to the uh, telcos where the edge is. And the other blueprint family called 5G Mac blueprint family, they are doing the 5G Mac slice B2B2C, like the operators gave the 5G call to the uh, internet company and they deploy the B2C services like cloud gaming, HD video, and the uh, live streaming. This is uh, uh, very successful in the deployment as the early 5G deployment. And also, uh, we don't forget enterprise uh, applications. There's a blueprint called Out Edge, uh, which provides the lightweight uh, edge applications for the um, uh, for for the for the telco edge, and it fully complies with the SMAC uh, MP1 and uh, MN3 and the other APIs. Yeah. Thank you. This is a very good question. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Thank you. So, um, am I supposed to ask next question? Allergy. Yeah, I think Malini. Yeah. I can. Yeah, maybe you can ask for me. I, I was hoping you were sharing. <laughs> I need to. She's Malini on the call. Or? I can't hear her. Yes. Yeah, she's in the call. Yeah. Uh, would you ask the but question I'm supposed? You cannot hear her. No. Oh, hi there. Sorry, sorry. I was on mute. Yeah. Extremely <laughs> sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, Balaji, with 5G being all the rage and different kinds of applications, can you tell us something about network slicing? 
what kind of use cases they support in 5G? Yeah, thanks, Malini, for this question. I mean, this is a pretty important and interesting question as we talk about um, 5G and overall edge, you know. And uh, But it's important. Before I talk about network slicing, uh, it's very, very important to understand uh, from the perspective of end users and also the customer's perspective. When I say customers, I mean our telco friends, telecom operators. So we need to understand what are the pain points and needs uh, you know how they plan to, how they are delivering the services to the enterprise users right or to different verticals so i i'll say three big points three pain points and you know network slicing will play a role there to address those pain points for example today uh, our telecom operators uh, you know uh, it takes long time to deliver some services right uh, sometimes it takes 3 months but uh, at the same time the end users the final customer who is consuming the service, they are looking for, uh, you know, asking more complex services, you know, more and more. Uh, they want more functionality. For example, the end users now, as we progress in 5G, there will be a demand for very low latency related services. Could be 5 milliseconds, could be 10 milliseconds. It could be for AR, VR, um, you know, mission critical uh, applications like healthcare. Uh, mining and manufacturing, many of these uh, different verticals, right? They demand uh, pretty low latency. And also the customers expect scaling. The things have to scale, whether it's core or it is transport or at the edge, they have to scale. Uh, then reliability is very key and also high availability. There are some services in IoT se segment, it's ultra reliable. They require ultra reliability, right? Then now we know security is so important so security is a big piece of it. So all these functionality and characteristics you need in a network to deliver those services, right? Also, don't forget about high bandwidth. Then the second one is uh, another pain point is agility. They want to deliver the services faster in a timely market. Not only they want to deliver services faster, it helps them to grow their top line. If you delay three months or take three months to deliver service, that's a three months of revenue lost. So the agility is very key. Obviously, the cost is very important because today uh, operators feel, look, I'm delivering all these services. My video bandwidth is going up. The data pipe is getting filled, but my revenue is not growing in parallel with that need. So the cost is very important. How do you address all of that? So that's where I say network slicing will come into play, will play a major role. Now, what is network slice? Network slice is nothing but uh, I think most of us are worked in transport. We are very familiar in the IP network, right? L3 VPN, L2 VPN, right? IP MPLS networks. So it's basically a logical separation of an IP network. Just think about that. It's the same concept, but here it's applied on a whole entire 5G networks, starting with the radio, the transport, and the core. It's an end-to-end -end slice. It's basically a logical separation within a mobile network and you can divide the mobile network in a logical manner, and then you can deliver services either to a specific vertical industry or for a specific use case. If you, take about, uh, if you talk about specific, for example, you want to deliver uh, to a manufacturing facility, right? And they can ask many different slices, even for one customer. So there are several combinations of network slicing can be done, but it's very important to do that. I mean, literally you can do a network slicing on a physical network, but it's very complex. So to have a good network slice, meaning uh, you know, highly flexible and capable, the network has to be virtualized. A programmable should be network needs to be programmable, such as use SDN right as a control. More than all of that, you need a glue on the top, what I call orchestration. Orchestration holds the glue for everything. So uh, you need an orchestrator, and it's intent-driven AIML-based orchestration that is required to automate the creation of this network slice, also do the end-to-end -end life cycle management of the network slice. So those are the key things. Now, the last point I want to tell is technology is one thing, great. Uh, eventually, we'll deliver it and people will use it. But it is very important, the organizational changes. More and more, we discuss with our operator friends. They also tell us, look, uh, you know, to leverage all these new technologies, uh, you know, it needs to match my own business goals and my strategy, right? So they are also changing their business strategy. They're looking into that. 
not only the business strategy, what about my operational model? The legacy operational model will not work. So a lot of things within an organization need to change to actually uh, to, to leverage, to, to fully utilize the, all the new technology, including the network slicing. Okay, uh, that's from my side. And uh, Roman, uh, I think uh, it's pretty interesting from where you come from. You are in a, from a startup community, and I, I do know you quite well. And uh, now, what is the role of, uh, I know you talk about, you know, every time we meet, you talk about Eve a lot. And what is the role of Eve uh, that is playing across the LFH projects, right? Uh, also, I heard you mentioned <laughs> all the time uh, to me, hey, you know, this is uh, Android for IoT. Can you share some, uh, you know, some highlights? What do you mean by all of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, I think I can talk for hours about that, but, you know, let's see if I can sit into, you know, five minutes or so. So uh, all of this exciting, you know, talk about 5G that we've been having so far, uh, it's important to realize that uh, Edge doesn't just mean service provider Edge. And by the way, if you want to, uh, you know, really educate yourself on how diverse and complex the Edge is, I highly recommend that you download Linux Foundation Edge white paper, you know, the Edge taxonomy, because I think it does a really great job of sort of differentiating uh, what kinds of, you know, types of Edge you would have to deal with if you want to build a complete end-to-end -end solution to your customers, right? So, so far, uh, just to give you an example, we've been talking about 5G, and 5G is definitely something that exists within the service provider edge. You know, that's the terminology that we came up with, and I actually very much like it. And Project Eve is what exists on the other end of it, right? You know, closer to the end user, and we actually do call it user edge from now on. So user edge is all of the devices that basically exist outside of data centers, right? Uh, these are the devices that can be uh, maybe it's a cash register in your you know favorite McDonald's uh, location, or maybe it's a small computer that's attached to a, a manufacturing equipment, or maybe it's something that basically sits uh, and measures a certain you know signal or certain uh, data point from the environment. All of that is basically user edge. And uh, just like we need tools and software platforms to uh, make use of service provider edge, like there has to be something that, you know, supports all of the 5G uh, service side, uh, we actually need a very much unified platform for the user edge. And EVE, EVE, by the way, stands for Edge Virtualization Engine. EVE tries to unify all of the complexity that exists on the user edge today. Because if you think about it, you know, user edge today is very similar, you know, in kind of, how it's being developed uh, to how, let's say, mobile computing used to be in the 90s, right? You know, because we all remember our, you know, at least I'm old enough, I remember my Ericsson phone and my Nokia phone and my BlackBerry and, you know, five other different phones, you know, and all of them were incompatible. And if I liked an application on one, I couldn't use it on the other. And it was a complete mess. And it, you know, we had to wait for iOS and, you know, then Android as an open solution to emerge to basically have a tremendous acceleration of that market and essentially turning it into a complete marketplace. So Eve is trying to do to the edge computing exactly the same type of unification and, you know, turning it into a market uh, that Android did for the mobile computing. So we would like to see Eve being used as a universal operating system on which uh, developers can develop any kind of edge application without worrying about compatibility with a particular embedded Linux distribution or figuring out what device driver to use. So Eve basically is trying to become that unifying abstraction layer that will separate you know, hardware manufacturers from the software providers. And hopefully, if we're lucky enough, and it feels like Eve is now having a pretty significant momentum, uh, the, uh, just the sheer ability to enable developers to develop for this humongous market uh, will get us to the next level in uh, user edge. So that's, that's how I see it. Yes, I think this is great, um, Roman. I uh, think like uh, Equino also integrated the EVE uh, into a big uh, IoT on the Smart Edge blueprint family. Uh, I have another question for Malini. 
uh, hey, Marini, I see you are one of Hi. the most vocal people in uh, EdgeX Foundry. It, it's a few years old now. Um, could you share with us some adoption use cases of that? Uh -huh. Delighted to answer that question. It is indeed a few years old, nearly four, and the focus of EdgeX is just Edge. Uh, it's, it's only dealing with connecting to southbound devices. It's able to do some local data processing through a rules engine and then export it to any cloud endpoint or even to another microservice running at the edge. Uh, so it assumes there's a you know container engine running at that edge. So I can think of it as a layer on top of Eve, if you will. And we have about a million downloads right now. So even if you say some of them are multiple, it's a significant number, and we have companies such as Accenture integrating with EdgeX. We have uh, Jianxing, uh, a company in China, using it for some very novel use cases, including some robotics. We have Thundersoft, another company in China. And we have other users right here in the US, and one of them is Intel, who's also a major contributor, that's using it for its open retail initiatives. Other than that, we have AppCard, Connexus, RF Rain, that's you know using it to connect with RFID use cases. So we're seeing some traction. We have a vertical solutions group where these users come and present their use cases and also like what they would like to see in the next release of the system. So, yep, we're seeing some traction, definitely in the open retail initiative. We'd also like to see how maybe edX could be used in the telco space and support AR, VR kind of use cases. I haven't yet seen much of that, but definitely we're seeing traction. It feels like a sense of maturing and, and that we're doing something right there. Thank you. So wait, that's me talking. Uh, how about another question to Balaji? So Balaji, you mentioned about you know, network slicing. Can you tell us something else about service exposure? I've heard you know, mention of that. How would network slicing and service exposure work together? Yeah, uh, thanks, Malini, uh, for the you know, very good question again. Um, it is connected somewhat together. Uh, let me give an example. Let me step back. In fact, uh, it kind of triggered my mind here because um, Roman mentioned about, uh, you know, iOS and Apple and things like that. Actually, that's a good way uh, to actually talk about this, right? Just think about it, uh, what Android in Google, by Google, and uh, iOS did for the mobile industry, right, the phone industry. And uh, so you have this, uh, you know, when, it, when they came up, so you have the iOS operating system on the mobile phone and then similar thing Android on the, you know, the, they share the market, right? So they could have done these two, uh, you know, Apple and uh, Google, they could have just uh, created the open source the Linux operating system and then left it like that. They didn't do that. They saw the business potential. What they have done is they've opened up APIs and they exposed that to massive amount of developers, uh, companies, application providers, system providers, platform providers, all kinds of people. What happened? They created an entire API economy on that. It's massive industry, right? We are all using that. We are benefits, you know, we get benefits out of that and also the whole industry. Just think about that. An operating system in a cell phone can create such, a, such an economy, you know, by exposing API. Just think about for a minute. The entire 5G network, if we expose it, what is the benefit to the you know, world population and the economy as a whole? So it's massive. So that's what the, you know, when I mean the service exposure, exposure can bring. Now, what's the connection between network slice? So think about this. If I create a network slice, for example, one of the enterprise customer wants, to, you know, hey, I need a dedicated, you know, low latency service, blah, blah, blah and then our operator creates a specific network slice for that enterprise, right? Now, it's a cumbersome task in a way, we want to automate that, right? So you can expose network slice as a service to the enterprise, or you can simply expose it so they can change. For example, today they are consuming with the 20 millisecond characteristics in a network slice. 
they may say, you know what, I want to change it to five milliseconds for 100 users, whatever, right? They could create another network slice or the existing network slice, they can change the parameters so that it is it is able to deliver them with enough resources for a five millisecond, you know, for, you know that type of a characteristics. So you want to open up, so you need to expose those services to the enterprises so they can actually leverage. That's just one example. Now, another example is SLA, uh, service level agreements, right? Uh, especially when you deal with verticals, uh, this industry is very critical. I hear a lot from, uh, from uh, my enterprise friends that uh, the penalty is pretty high for certain verticals. You have to deliver and meet those SLAs. It's very stringent SLAs. So what operators can do is they will actually, their performance data, the network data, they will expose in a way, uh, you know, they show, hey, this is the level of services that we are delivering. So the, the exposure can be used, uh, you know, many different ways. This SLA is one way. Now, they can also uh, expose to uh, developers. And then they, you know, create a, like a sandbox, right? Create a network slice for a bunch of developer community. And they can actually create a use cases and business models out of that. And you can test it like a canary deployment, right? Network slicing can play a role. And then test it, see, and then if it's great, you introduce to the mass market. So there are a lot of things you can use by, you know, exposing APIs from the entire 5G network. You know, I call 5G network as an innovation platform. So that's where the exposure plays a role. Yeah, thank you, Faraji. Um, this is, I, I really like uh, how you elaborated that. Uh, I'm just curious, I have a question for Roman. And would you tell us uh, what's the next on the EVE roadmap? Yeah, absolutely. Right now is actually great timing because we just released uh, full support for Raspberry Pi. You know, again, Raspberry Pi is a pretty good platform to uh, try out all sorts of edge ideas. And it's interesting because uh, this is one of the examples of how EVE helps uh, upstream projects. So we actually did this together with Zen because, you know, EVE is based on hypervisors. So Zen is one of the hypervisors that we're using. Zen is also part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, and uh, doing that, you know, just making Xen available in a package that is EVE on Raspberry Pi generated a tremendous amount of uh, excitement uh, in the developer community. So you can actually go online, and, you know, we're kind of proud that we got covered by Slashdot, Hacker News, you know, ZDNet, pretty much, you know, every single uh, tech publication out there. So we will definitely do more things on Raspberry Pi. Um, so that's for sure on the roadmap. You know, we feel like we need to make sure that Raspberry Pi can be really integrated into a lot of the uh, um, edge projects, right? Uh, and at least as an entry point solution, it's actually pretty good. Um, in general, though, you know, we're trying to integrate more and more hypervisors uh, into EVE. So if you are on the roadmap, so uh, we had a few, you know, uh, patches from Intel uh, on Acorn hypervisors. So we feel that, you know, we need to finish that up, and hopefully by the end of the year we will have a full Acorn support. And finally, what is super exciting to us is that we're actually doing full integration of uh, the only – uh, Kubernetes distribution, K3S, that has been fully optimized for the edge deployments. So EVE is basically coming out in Q4 with full K3S integration. So these are probably the top most, you know, highlights. But if you want to check out more, just, you know, join the project, go to the wiki page, it's all out there, you know, join Slack channel, ask questions, and help us make it better. Thank you, Romy. Okay. Thank you, uh, Roman. That was a nice explanation. And uh, Malini, uh, so coming back to you, Malini, uh, you are the guru for us in the EdgeX side. You've been there for quite some time. Now, what are the new things that is coming up in the roadmap? Can you enlighten us on EdgeX roadmap a little bit? Um, so we're about to release our, you know, H release, Hanoi. And what's coming up next is that we are looking at a V2 API. We've had our V1 API for about a year and a half, but with V2, we want to be able to specify a schema, what goes in, what comes out, so it has a more structured format. Another thing we want to support is device discovery. So let's say you have a profile for 
you know, a mobile phone or a light bulb or or something on your factory floor. And as devices come in and then they say, hey, you know, what's out there? Can I report into my edge gateway? And that'll reduce the task, especially when you have lots of devices to self-register them, the discovery process. So that's the next thing coming along. And we're also very proud of the fact that this H release will have a command line interface. I mean, we're all familiar that we use kubectl and then, you know, Git, et cetera. They're so useful, um, but EdgeX didn't have one, and we, VMware, have actively developed, designed, and we're about to deliver this. So there will be a V1 CLI and then a V2 CLI in the next releases being planned. So that's pretty much what we have right now, and our rules engine is is stronger, better. Our app function SDK that's coming, you know, uh, down the pike in its V2 version will support more end use cases, uh, not just massaging the data, maybe compressing the data, making addition of rules and pipelines of data processing much more robust. So that's what we're having on the roadmap coming up. Thank you, Balaji, for that question. Yeah, that was an awesome answer. Uh, but since we're on this subject of great things cooking up in LS Edge, I guess I also have a similar question for Tina. Uh, so, Tina, anything that you could highlight for us, you know, that's super exciting cooking up and coming down the pike in Akrena? Uh, sure. Thank you for the uh, great questions. Um, so uh, Acrino has a very strong community support uh, for the testing. There's a blueprint validation framework, has all the way from the hardware operating system, virtualization, and application. You can get all the automated uh, scripts and tested the blueprint. And also there's a security check uh, on the code, like Vars, Venice, Kubi Edge, uh, sorry, uh, Kubi Hunter, all the security scanning and also checking uh, the APIs, whether they are compiling in, in a good format uh, from the Equino uh, APIs. And uh, also there were community uh, labs uh, in Equino, and we have uh, many more user labs uh, across the whole world. Uh, in this case, we provide uh, um, fully CICD and the um, <clears throat> We provide the fully CICD and also the uh, uh, um, the deployable and lifecycle support and the lifecycle support and the uh, deployable uh, blueprints for the end user and developers and the deployers to use. Thank you for asking this question. Yeah, that's great. Well, Thank I you, Tina. Uh, I think, yeah, go ahead, Roman. No, I was just about to say that was a great uh, discussion, but I guess we're running out of time, right, Balaji? Yeah, we got about a couple of minutes, uh, you know, mark of you know getting into getting to a thirty minutes. Uh, if audience has, if they have any question, actually, they can put it in chat box. So we'll try to answer them. Uh, I see only Aaron Williams has provided the LFH taxonomy link. I'm looking for any other chat questions. Uh, from uh, any questions here, not yet. And we also have a Slack channel, don't we? Oh yeah, we can even go there, yeah. I won't be able to do it, but uh, yeah, you guys uh, can go there. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we may give maybe, uh, say another few seconds to see any question comes up. Still have the audience, uh, around 32 people on the call, I see. Uh, but let's see any. Uh, Is uh, Aaron's up. link visible to everybody on the chat? I mean, everybody who's attending? Oh, probably not. Uh, Aaron, can you? Uh, I don't know, he's on the call, uh, but he can uh, actually, we can select Wait, let that me and cut prioritize. That in. Yeah. Yeah, I see he, they can. Malini, people okay. can see that. All right. Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, yeah, great. I think if we don't have questions then, right, uh, I think uh, then we can uh, close out the session and uh, we will. Uh, we thank all the audience participants. 
who participated and uh, patient enough to listen to us and uh, we really appreciate that more than anything let's end with like please come and join us we'd like more contributors yes. use cases and tell us what works what doesn't work if you have any gaps um, please come and join us yeah our slack channels are very friendly you know and uh, would love to see you there Okay. See you then. Thank you, bye Mario. Bye. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, bye, bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have an awesome day.